Hello, Fulcrum Knights. It is I, Harry the Reader. Welcome back to the audiobook of Star Wars Slave Ship by K.W. Jetta. I've got to be quiet. I'm on board the Hound's Tooth, Bosk's ship. Now, I was talking to Bosk, but I was just going. But he thought I left before I did. I stopped to use Lou. And he thinks I'm not here yet. And I don't know if you can hear that, but if I just... We can get a recording of a very rare thing indeed. Sometimes I cannot take this place. Sometimes it's my life I can taste. Sometimes I cannot feel my face. You'll never see me fall from grace. It's just he's got his AirPods in, you see. He can't hear anything, so he doesn't realise I'm still on board. Well, while we're here, we might as well read some comments. Let's see. Matt Curtis responded to my request for more challenge to Boba last week and says the Legends book Bloodlines is a good book for challenging Boba Fett. The book explores both the Solo family and the Fett family, including Boba Fett's daughter and her daughter, and she challenges Fett for being an absent father. Boba Fett learns the Mandalorian language by being sworn at. Thanks very much for the recommendation, Mac. I might have to check that one out. Tony has said in the comments, The miners were very interesting. In the book Darth Plagueis, there is a reference to the Caminos supplying shovel-handed clones to work in the mines of inhospitable Subterrell. I wonder if the Empire took this information from Camino before they destroyed it. A good idea and a very plausible one. Sweet Mango Limited says, I've got to agree with you. I really love this chapter, regarding the last one, in regards to getting to know Bosk better. Have to say, I'm kind of liking the fella. I also love that we know what he's thinking. He does make me chuckle. Hey, let's check in on him. Well, he seems happy enough, so we might as well carry on reading now as we get into Chapter 12. When news comes from far away, it sometimes accumulates power on its journey, like a tidal wave on the surface of an aquatic planet that rolls uninterrupted and gathers greater and greater force in doing so until it can wrench that world off its spinning axis or sweep up on its curving face and then crush any leviathan creature smaller than itself. Such dark, brooding meditations came easily to those of the Farleen species. Prince Zizor stood at the small viewport, gazing out at the stars and the emptiness in which they were held. The thumb and forefinger of one hand stroked the sharp angles of his chin as his thoughts progressed through their courses. He had already heard the news, the fulfilment of the next step in his intricately woven plans before he had made the return journey to this place. Indeed, he had been expecting the news at any moment, as he had waited in the private quarters of his ship, Virago. Some things, he mused, are as certain as the galaxy's own slow rotation. Many of his own actions and schemes were based upon a cold assessment of calculated risks. The most dangerous of those added a blood-stirring excitement to his life. To stake all upon the turn of a card, to use the most ancient gambler's metaphor, everything, including the very life he savoured at such moments, was the ultimate sport. But that was not the kind of lower-keyed satisfaction he derived from betting on a sure thing. And in this universe, as he had demonstrated over and over again, nothing seemed as certain as one Boba Fett bounty hunter. A sound of scrabbling claws and a slight motion caught the corner of Zizor's eye. He turned and saw one of Kadama Bat's subnodes, a little crab-like thing tethered by a whitely glowing neurofilament to the web's connection fibres. Yes. 
Zizor raised an eyebrow as he regarded the semi-independent creature clinging to the wall in front of him. What is it? The subnode's mouth, nearly humanoid in size, opened and emitted words. Your presence is desired, my lord. Its voice was a squeaky approximation of its own master's. In the main throne room and conference area. Very well. He gave a single nod of acknowledgement. Tell Kadama Bat that I will be with him shortly. Zizor let the subnode lead the way, through the cramped angles and turns of the web's internal corridors. The rough textured walls, with their structural fibres of varying thicknesses, compressed to a solid mass, were faintly illuminated by the phosphorescence of other subnodes dangling at intervals above idiot creations of their assembler parent. They had no more intelligence than was sufficient to monitor the slow catalyst and decay of the light-producing compounds in their globular bodies, each barely larger than the span of Zizor's palm. When their glow had dwindled sufficiently, the instincts with which they had been designed and extruded would send them creeping back to Kadama Bat to be re-ingested by their creator. Zizor felt no pity for them. He shared the attitude that lesser creatures were for the service of their masters. He ducked his head to make his way through one of the lower ceilinged areas in the web. His broad, heavily muscled shoulders scraped against the matted walls on either side. Aboard the Virago, even the narrowest passageways were wider than he could have reached with his hands fully outstretched. His own personal quarters on the ship were as luxuriously appointed as the reception hall of many a planet-bound ruler's palace. It was a test of his will to voluntarily return to Kadama Bat's space-drifting web and enter its dank, claustrophobic spaces. Only the prospect of successfully concluding some long-standing business schemes was enough to entice him anywhere near the arachnoid assembler and its scuttling, scurrying brood of subnodes. Ah, my most precious Zizor, sunlight of my drab experience! Kadama Bat perched on the pneumatic cushion of the subnode that served as its throne. The assembler's spike-haired forelimbs lifted and waved in a grotesque parody of a welcoming gesture. How deeply embarrassed am I to have kept one of your exquisite eminence waiting. Please accept my most humbly prostrated apologies. No need for that. Zizor could already feel his own patience draining away inside himself. The assembler's flowery language always irritated him, suspecting as he did that every word that came from Kadama Bat's mouth was tinged with venomous sarcasm. He stood before the assembler, arms folded across his chest. I was told upon my arrival here at your web that important news had just been received, and that was the reason for delaying our meeting. His vibra-blade sharp gaze took in Kadama Bat and the various subnodes clustered around it or perching on various limbs. If the news had that kind of urgency for you, then I wonder if it could possibly have some bearing on our mutual interests. All of the multiple eyes that studied Kadama Bat's face shifted uneasily for a moment as if revealing the agile contortions of the mind that lay behind them. Then, the assembler creaked out an unpleasantly high-pitched laugh. <laughs> Why is it, my so esteemed Prince Zizor, that you already know all about the news that I've just heard? Granted, your native intelligence is of a nature many awesome degrees above my own. But still, for you to acquire such information before me... Kadama Bat shook one of the tiny subnodes from its forelimb, then used the exposed claw point to scratch the tip of its chin. 
How it grieves me to harbor suspicions against one so uniquely dear to me as yourself. The pain! Nevertheless... Kodama Bat's two main eyes peered closer at its visitor. I would hate to believe that your information-gathering sources, the great and efficient network of your Black Sun organization, had been monitoring developments in this little matter independently from my own favorite and trusted spies. That would tend to indicate, oh, the horror, that you, dear Prince Zizor, did not trust me. I trust you, all right. One corner of Zizor's mouth lifted in a grim smile. There are some things that I can absolutely depend on to happen when I'm dealing with you. Given any opportunity, you'll lie, cheat, embezzle, and in other ways seek to gain an advantage over a business partner. Withholding or changing a few important details about some matter in which we both have an interest. That would be one of the lesser offences you would commit. Hmm. The assembler appeared nettled. It turned its narrow face away from Zizor and spent some time fussing with its nest-like throne, poking and prodding it with its lower set of limbs. The pneumatic subnode bore the assault with a dull patience. Very well, be that as it may. Kadamba Bat finally settled its globular abdomen back into its nest beneath. If I'm going to be criticized for being a business creature and taking care of business the way I should, no more, no less, then I shall just have to accept that as my lot in this universe. Spare me, said Zizor. He didn't know which was worse, Kadamabat's unctuous flattery or its occasional spasms of self-pity. You've done all right by yourself. Zizor gestured with an upraised hand, indicating the matted fibres of this tight space and all the smaller ones beyond. Consider the treasures you've accumulated. True. Kadama Bat's bead-like eyes glittered as their gaze darted around the area. Here, just as throughout the web, the structure's fibres were intertwined with various bits and pieces of machinery and high-level comm gear all of it filched and salvaged from various spacecraft that had been unfortunate enough to have fallen into the assembler's control, usually to pay off the owner's debts, the invariable cost of doing business with such a clever and avaricious creature. I have so many pretty things, pretty and rare and expensive as well. Idiot. Zizor didn't bother to conceal the sneer that showed on his face. Some of the scavenged gear in Kadama Bat's web worked. That was how the assembler managed to keep track of his many far-flung schemes on different worlds. But the rest were inert and useless. Useless except to one of its solitary species. The assembler seemed to value the process of acquisition as much as the results. Constantly absorbing things both dead and alive into its network of self-generated neural fibres, making them as much a part of itself as the subnodes that it designed and extruded for its service. That was the sum of Kadama Bat's existence. Its complex schemes were woven for the same reason as the physical web that it squatted in, drifting past the stars and their circling worlds because it had no other way of existing separate from the strands of that web and those schemes. It exuded both the way other creatures breathed. Zizor glanced at the thickly matted strands near his shoulders. It struck him again that he was standing, almost literally, inside another creature's head, its thoughts having taken on an animated, tangible form. That realisation filled him as it always had before, with a subtle nausea. But, said Zizor aloud, 
There are so many more things that you'd like to have. And that is why we're in business together. Exactly so, my dear Zizor. Kadamabat's face split into a jagged grin. Forgive me for ever having doubted your so deeply held distrust and low opinion of me. Be assured, it's mutual. Then let's get down to it. Now that you've heard what I already know, there's hard merchandise on its way here. Boba Fett has captured Trahin Vossant. Did we anticipate anything else? Kadama Bat imitated a humanoid shrug with the rising of a pair of forelimbs. Boba Fett never fails. That's why we made him an integral part of our plans. If Fett goes out after a bounty, he always collects. And a bounty such as the one that the Emperor offered for Versant? Well, another shrug, slightly less exaggerated. It was a certainty that he would go after it. As would every other bounty hunter in the galaxy, Zizor pointed out. That was the other part, the other predictable part of the scheme. Even as we speak, the other bounty hunters, the few that are left of them, are still at each other's throats, backstabbing and conspiring against one another. The news has not reached them yet that the inspiration for all their unbridled greed is already in the hands of Boba Fett. By the time the other bounty hunters learn that Trahin Vossant is being captured, it'll be too late for them to escape the consequences of their actions. There are no longer two factions of bounty hunters. The True Guild and the Guild Reform Committee are finished. Avarice has the power to accomplish such things, to turn one creature against another, who a moment before had been calling themselves family. The savouring of that accomplished fact was like a rich, intoxicating liquor on Zizor's tongue. He had always despised the tendency of lesser creatures to form themselves into would-be protective groups. Whether it was the old, vanished Bounty Hunters Guild, or this new rebel alliance that was enjoying its brief moment in the sun. There was a time, continued Zizor, when these bounty hunters had considered themselves bound by their so-called hunter's creed, as if that little pact would have been enough to keep their enmity for each other in check. Well, that precious fiction is gone at last, and good riddance. There may be a few left who give it lip service, but the rest have discovered the truth about themselves and each other. Indeed they have. Kadama Bat nodded his triangular head in agreement. So excellent and foresighted was your scheme, my dear Zizor. I congratulate you on its success. Not that it was ever in doubt, of course. Between you and Boba Fett, how could it have turned out otherwise? Zizor ignored the assembler's flattery. It was superfluous at any rate. He had set out to destroy the old Bounty Hunters Guild and had done so. Boba Fett had been no more than the tool in his hand, as sharply efficient as a sculptor's honed chisel. The first blow had been enough to divide the guild into two rival factions. This final one had smashed those into their constituent atoms. There wouldn't be very many of those left alive by the time the process had reached its end. Bounty hunting was a ruthlessly competitive trade, one in which the best way to assure one's survival was to eliminate as many of the others in it before they had a chance to eliminate you. However stodgy and inefficient the old guild had been, it had at least managed to hold down the level of mayhem among the individual bounty hunters. Now, without even the two remnant splinter organizations around, it was open season in the trade. The corpses were already starting to pile up. Of course, that was also to Prince Zizor's liking. Only the toughest and most capable bounty hunters would survive such a winnowing out of their numbers, and the skills of those would be even sharper and more enhanced by it. 
Perhaps there would never be another bounty hunter the equal of Boba Fett. So be it. But now there would be others, harder and more murderous in their quick, bright, lethal grace. They would be perfect. Not just for the uses of Palpatine's empire, but also for that of the darker empire that lay in its shadows, which was so fittingly known as the Black Sun. Yes, said Zizor, nodding slowly. It could have been no other way, even if we had not made sure of the outcome ourselves. The assembler emitted a harsh, crackling laugh that was taken up and echoed by the piping voices of the subnodes clustered around it. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Boba Fett! Overcome by its hideous glee, Kadama Bat waved its forelimbs. Think of how much trouble he might have saved for himself if he had known that Trahim Vasant, the supposedly renegade stormtrooper, was acting on Palpatine's direct orders the whole time. As much as he admired Boba Fett, Zizor couldn't help feeling a certain pleasure at having hoodwinked the famous bounty hunter. And... It had been accomplished just as Kadama Bat had said. The whole thing had been a setup, and all the bounty hunters had fallen for it. Zizor knew that that had been a major part of the attraction for Emperor Palpatine, and why he had agreed to the subterfuge, as long as Zizor had put up the bounty stake from his own personal fortune. Far from being a renegade and a traitor, Trahin Vossant was actually one of the Emperor's most loyal soldiers, loyal enough and obedient enough that he had been willing to follow orders that resulted at least temporarily in the blackening of his reputation amongst the ranks of his fellow Imperial stormtroopers. And more to that, to fully establish his cover story of being a renegade, ruthlessly following his own personal agenda, The others involved in the hijacking of the Imperial ship had to be killed, and by Vossant's own hand. Those orders he had carried out with no hesitation as well. The stolen codes had been a minor issue compared to that. Before the plan had gotten even underway, measures to eliminate the damage caused by the sale of the obsolete data had already been in place. Just as Zizor had anticipated, the final result of his preparations was a perfect enticement to the greed of the individual bounty hunters, and more than enough to dissolve the two remaining factions into which the old guild had splintered. The final collapse into every creature for itself anarchy, the remnants of the old bounty hunters' guild disintegrating into nothing but memories, had been a result that Emperor Palpatine had been glad to hear of. Before coming here to Kadama Bat's drifting web, Zizor had had another meeting with the Emperor in his throne room on the planet Coruscant, and had received the Emperor's congratulations on a job well done. All the while, the holographic image of Lord Darth Vader had fumed in silence, unable to make any protest without risking either the Emperor's mockery or his wrath, or both. Zizor had savoured the moment of triumph, even while aware that whatever enmity Vader had previously borne him, it was now multiplied many times over. The only thing worse than failing in a contest of wills between oneself and the Dark Lord of the Sith was to win out over him. Vader did not take the humiliation of defeat lightly. There will be consequences... Zizor assured himself. The day of reckoning between himself and Vader had only been postponed. When it came, only one of them would be alive afterward. He would be prepared for that confrontation. Zizor knew that he was in an even stronger position than he had been before. Now, Zizor mused, Palpatine thinks he's gotten what he wanted. A tougher, harder breed of mercenary bounty hunters, all of them ready to do the Empire's dirty work, for a price. And without the old guild keeping them non-competitive and fat and lazy. That's good for the Empire, Zizor nodded slowly to himself. 
It's even better for Black Sun. You've done well for yourself, my dear Zizor. Nestled before him, Kadama Bat had discerned the course of Zizor's silent thoughts. You've more than proved your value to Palpatine. That will stand you in good stead in the future, with all the rest of you plans and schemes. The Emperor's favor will shine down upon you like the warming sunlight of a tropical world. He's known for rewarding cleverness and loyalty. Not as much as you might think, replied Zizor. I have no illusions in that regard. The Emperor will keep me as his right hand as long as he considers me to be a valuable instrument of his will. If anything should happen to dispel that sense of value, then I will be just that much closer to him, so that he, or Darth Vader, can crush the breath from my throat. Needless worries, needless, I say. Kadama Bat bestowed his jagged smile on the web's guest. Whatever obstacles are arrayed before you in your traversal of the maze that is Emperor Palpatine's court, I'm sure you'll negotiate them with your usual and commendable alacrity. Zizor returned the smile. I'm sure I will as well. He tilted his head in a mocking half-bow toward the assembler. How can I fail to, with an accomplice such as yourself on my side? Oh, how sweet of you to say so. Then may I take it that all issues of distrust between ourselves are dispelled? Of course not, you idiot. Zizor shook his head in disgust. The day I trust a creature such as yourself will be the day I sign my own death warrant. But enough of that. Let's get down to business. Whatever, sulked Kadama Bat. As you wish. It gestured with the tip of one forelimb. Please, proceed. It's one thing to congratulate ourselves on having achieved the objective of our plans, the total disintegration of the Bounty Hunters Guild. If you wish to bask in the warm glow that comes with such an accomplishment, then do it when you're by yourself, Kadama Bat. Voice turning harder, Zizor leaned toward the assembler. But right now... There's plenty of work left to be done if we're to enjoy the results of our schemes. One doesn't put plans such as these into motion without creating certain, shall we say, messes that need to be cleaned up. Indeed. Kadama Bat nodded judiciously. It is exactly as you say, my dear Zizor. We have brought some participants into these intrigues who might not be exactly pleased to find out the role they've been unwittingly forced to play. That much was true. Zizor had already admitted as much to himself. The stormtrooper is not much of a problem, said Zizor. The fact that Trahin Vossant carried out the orders that he was given and played his part in this little masquerade indicates a certain naivete on his part. That's often the case with these military types. They train to trust their superiors. The Imperial Stormtroopers could not survive if they allowed any doubt within their ranks. And, in Vossant's case, he was promised a great deal in addition if he played his role well. Really? The Assembler tilted its head to one side. What exactly did Emperor Palpatine promise Vassant? Retirement, Prince Zizor shrugged. A modest pension, based upon his years of service in the Stormtroopers. You have to remember, very few of their number live long enough to enjoy those things, given what they have to go through and what they have to do along the way. A little peace and quiet is all they want for their last days. How touching! And what will Trahin Vossant receive instead? Leave that to me, Zizor said coldly. He bore the stormtrooper no ill will. Whatever happened to Vossant now was a matter of simple necessity. Vossant had become a loose end, something that had to be cleaned up 
and disposed of before he could create any embarrassments for those who had devised the scheme in which he had played so vital a part. Old soldiers tended to talk about their adventures, a few indiscreet details leaking out concerning how other stormtroopers had been duped and killed, would have serious impact on the morale of those still serving in the Emperor's forces. The Rebel Alliance could use that kind of information as a way of encouraging mass defections, merely by offering any survival-minded stormtroopers a safe haven out of the reach of their commanding officers and their murderous Emperor. For that reason alone, Trahin Vossant was not going to receive the peaceful retirement that had been promised to him. He knew too much. Zizor had already assured the Emperor that Vossant would be taken care of permanently. And what about Boba Fett? A note of amusement sounded in Kadama Bat's voice. Wrapping up that particular loose end might be just a little more difficult. He is, after all, not quite the same sort of trusting individual as Trahin Vassant. That's my problem, and I'll take care of it. Zizor had already given the matter its due consideration. Unfortunately for both himself and Boba Fett, the only possible solution was the same one that would be applied in the Stormtrooper Vossant's case. Zizor made it a general rule of business never to create a situation where someone else had an advantage over him. Only a fool, he had long ago decided, hands a weapon over to a potential enemy. It was just as foolish to leave a weapon lying where an enemy might find it and pick it up. And, in the universe he lived and operated in, everyone was an enemy, sooner or later. It was just safer to make that assumption from the beginning. Boba Fett had one of the most carefully groomed networks of information sources in the galaxy. That was a big part of his success as a bounty hunter. It was only reasonable to expect that some of those sources might be located in the ranks of Black Sun itself. Fett might not know it now, but the truth might be discovered at any moment, that it had been Prince Zizor who had instigated the Bounty Hunters Guild's destruction. To allow even the possibility of Boba Fett, with his devious mind and appetite for gain, acquiring such a damaging piece of information to hold over him, that would be madness. Even if he then eliminated Boba Fett, the problem remained of all the others who might have learned the truth from him. Too many creatures would bear Zizor a grudge then, even if he managed to evade every bounty hunter who had some remaining vestige of loyalty to the old organization, to do so would endlessly complicate his existence. And it would only take one of them. With a stroke of luck, and all his plans for Black Sun would expire along with his own life. No, thought Zizor. The decision had already been made. Fett's silence and the bounty hunter's death were one and the same thing, and too valuable not to bring about. I'm entirely confident, purred Kadama Bat that it will be taken care of and in your usual officious manner. Of that I have no doubt, my dear Zizor. The only question is when. I prefer to sleep soundly here in my humble web, safe among my treasures, my dreams undisturbed by the awareness of bounty hunters with a grievance against me. My only wish is to coexist with my fellow creatures of the galaxy in a harmonious manner as much as possible. The thought of Boba Fett still on the loose somewhere and bearing uncharitable thoughts towards me, that would impinge itself most ungraciously upon my slumbers. Don't worry said Zizor grimly. He had already made his decision about that part in the matter as well. When there were messes to be cleaned up, they had to be taken care of, right down to the tiniest detail. 
or the potentially most valuable. The bounty hunter, Boba Fett, would undoubtedly have had his uses in the future for both the Empire and for Black Sun. In some ways, Fett was one of the most irreplaceable creatures in the galaxy, with a necessary function to serve as long as one had the means to pay for it. Plus, Zizor had to admit himself he felt a certain admiration for the hunter. Boba Fett's efficiency and ruthlessness were truly inspirational qualities, which Zizor had pointed out to his underlings in Black Sun on many occasions as models worthy of their emulation. The galaxy would be a kinder, gentler place with Boba Fett removed from it. The notion filled Prince Zizor with disgust. How paradoxical, he mused. That ruthlessness requires that the most ruthless be exterminated. Still, if it came down to a choice between his own survival and that of Boba Fett, then the bounty hunter was already history. I am, sighed Kadama Bat, a creature given to worry. It's my nature. The assembler gestured with his forelimbs toward the subnodes clustered around it. I have so many responsibilities. That's why I'm forced to admit that I have grave concerns about your plans for taking care of Boba Fett. Others have tried to take care of him in the past, and things did not turn out well for those improvident creatures. That's the difference between them and me. When I take care of something, it remains that way. Don't forget, I have the resources of not only the Empire, but Black Sun behind me as well. Boba Fett has never come up against a combination such as that. To prevail against a lot of slobbering huts and similar creatures with their shabby, insignificant networks of spheres of influence is one thing. To survive against the forces I command is quite another. Your confidence, my dear Zizor, is so powerful as to evoke awe in one such as myself. It should be. The Farleen prince reached over to the edge of his cape and drew it across his chest. He was ready to leave the web now to make sure of his other preparations. Your only true concern, Kadama Bat, is playing out your own role in this last stage of our plans. The assembler drew back on its pneumatic nest. My thespic skills are so dreadfully limited. We've done all right so far, said Zizor. It was your expert line that got Boba Fett involved in the scheme against the Bounty Hunters Guild in the first place. He fell for it then, as he had no reason to disbelieve you. Similarly, he has no reason for distrust now. Fett has in his possession certain hard merchandise, as he and the other bounty hunters like to refer to their captives, namely one Trehin Vossant, assumed to be a renegade imperial stormtrooper. You, the assembler, Kadama Bat, are holding in escrow the bounty payment for the delivery of that merchandise. Zizor glanced up toward one of the larger subnodes that held on to the fibrous wall near Kadama Bat. Is that not so? That is a true and verified statement, replied the subnode called Balance Sheet, regarding certain credit funds now on deposit in this web. The entire amount of the bounty for the Imperial Stormtrooper Vassant is at the moment in our possession, just as you say, Prince Zizor. And that is precisely something I'm nervous about. The subnode's creator fidgeted in its nest. That is a considerable amount of credits for me to be sitting on. Perhaps the largest amount that's ever been here at one time in my web. I've always considered it to be a prudent policy to shift my financial assets into reputable planetary banking establishments within the control boundaries of the Empire. 
Otherwise, I'm just too much of a target out here alone in empty space. Nobody would ever rob you, Kadama Bat. Your go-between and the escrow services are too valuable for too many creatures. Besides, I stationed my own Virago close at hand, along with several other craft from Black Sun's operational fleet. Their firepower should be more than enough protection for you, until the bounty is safely out of your hands. That may be. Kadama Bat didn't appear entirely satisfied with the answer. But is it enough to protect me from Boba Fett? Leave the bounty hunter to me, said Zizor. For someone to whom lying comes so easily, it should not be a task to strain your capabilities. He turned away, having had more than his fill of the assembler's protests. As he headed down the shoulder-cramping space of the web's central corridor, Zizor could hear the assembler sputtering and fussing behind him. A short time later, another voice spoke to Zizor as he waited in the web's docking area for the small shuttle vessel that would return him to the Virago. Excuse me. The small voice smoked from close by with Zizor's head. I wonder if I might have a word with you, just by ourselves. Zizor glanced beside himself and spotted the accountant subnode, balance sheet, dangling upside down from the matted ceiling of the area. What do you want? As I said. The subnode's voice was a carefully modulated whisper. A word with you on subjects that would be of mutual and profitable interest to us. Profitable to your master, Kadama Bat, as well? Zizor shook his head. I'm familiar enough with how the assembler's web is constructed. Everything here is spun directly from Kadama Bat's own neural tissue. Looking into Balance Sheet's bright, bead-like eyes, Zizor knew that he might as well be looking straight into the assembler's sharp, avid gaze. Why Kadama Bat was going through this pretense, sending one of his semi-independent nodes after him like this, was beyond comprehension. Does he think I'm so easily fooled? I've already said to him all that I care to for the moment. I think you have misapprehended the situation, said Balance Sheet evenly, as well as exactly whom you're talking to. Upside down, the subnode crept a little closer to Zizor. One of its tiny claws held up a glistening white strand of neurofiber. The strand was broken, connected only to balance sheet, but not to the structure of the web. You see, I'm an independent agent now. When you talk to me, Kadarma Bat knows nothing of it. Unless I want Kadarma Bat to know. Zizor regarded the subnode with suspicion. You've managed to unplug yourself from the web? Well, that's very ingenious of you. But how is it that Kadarma Bat is not aware of one of his valuable subnodes having separated itself from the larger organism? Simple. Balance sheet reached over and picked up another, larger strand of fibre that led directly into the intricately knotted structure surrounding them. At this fibre's tip was another subnode, smaller and with claws almost too delicate to be seen. Kadama Bat is not the only one here who can create subnodes. I have mastered the art as well. This is one of mine. Balance Sheet held the tiny, tethered organism out for Zizor's inspection. Its only function is to masquerade as me, to send neurosignals into the web that falsely indicate that I'm still attached and subservient to Kadarma Bad. Trust me, the old assembler has not the slightest clue as to any of this. Indeed. Zizor was impressed both with the subnode's ingenuity and the possibilities it presented. Kadama Bat had been getting on his nerves for a long time now. Perhaps the assembler's usefulness was already coming to an end. 
You're right about one thing. And what is that? Balance Sheet's bright, round eyes peered into Zizor's gaze. We do have a lot to talk about. Oh, a turn out for the books there. We knew it was coming. We knew there was going to be a day where Balance Sheet started to take on Kadama Bat. And it's here. Oh, yes. This this chapter was another one of the, the long conversations. Nice to see more of the scheming. Nice to have some more fun with Kadama Bat. But this was the best part of it. Seeing Balance Sheet finally breaking off and starting to scheme against him. Kadar, you didn't move fast enough and you knew it. You should have eaten this guy long ago. How did you guys feel about that ending and about the chapter in general and also the, the, the intrigue that's happening here? So we're now seeing that there is going to be a plot at the end of this to kill Boba Fett in order to tie up loose ends. Any thoughts as to what Prince Zizor's plan to actually take out the most fearsome bounty hunter in the galaxy? What could that be? Because that's a pretty tall order. After a chapter like that, I think it's appropriate to read this from Nam Reapus. I do wish there was more of a storyline that narrated and informed the details of Vader's thoughts process and activities during these time frames. Prince Zizor has a lot of dialogue and interior thought processes, and I'd be curious to explore Vader's dynamic. I'm not as familiar with this book series and timeline, so if there is a book out there that has a kind of interlinear story on the side of Vader, I'd be most intrigued. I don't know, Nam, uh, if anyone else out there in the comments could let us know, that'd be helpful. Uh, but I do agree, it's interesting you don't see much of Vader's side of this. He's much more of a fringe character who's just seen a little bit, only mentioned in brief in this chapter. Phil in the comments says, I would have liked the Disney Plus version of Boba to show him building his own empire slash gang with this you are useful to me kind of attitude. Make him cunning and it's just business-like. Maybe include some more of the old school bounty hunters. Don't you love how they say it like a million times? That's why he's the top? Yeah, Phil, I I'm with you on all of that and right until the end there, I think. <laughs> they, do they do say that a little too much in this book. But I do also agree that it is kind of sad the Book of Boba, at least in my opinion, wasn't that kind of real kind of gangland sort of, you know, more kind of gritty drama. More like what Andor's been, but rather on the side of crime rather than rebels. I, I can... I don't know exactly why Disney did that. I suspect it's because Boba Fett is such a toy character, as in, you know, very successful in merch and things. So I think a lot of kids like him, so they didn't want him to be an overt bad guy. But a Boba Fett show that's more like Breaking Bad would have been pretty cool, you know? That's more just crime or, or The Wire or The Sopranos, that kind of thing. And Morgan in the comments said this about uh, the level of challenge to Boba. I feel what you mean about Boba Fett. He has challenges, but they seem to be directed more at the people around him, and it just seems almost too good sometimes. But I really can't complain, because if he wasn't so good, I'd probably be complaining he wasn't good enough. Lol. And you know what, Morgan? That's a good point, and I will keep that in mind. I think you, you have found some truth in that. And on to chapter 13 now, which goes forward in time, so during the events of Star Wars Return of the Jedi. He couldn't stop thinking about the bounty hunter. Kuat of Kuat knew that he was wasting time. The past was the past, and couldn't be altered. There are messes that must be cleaned up. He told himself as he gazed out at the Kuat Drive Yard's construction docks. That cleaning up process had to happen now, in real time. The longer it was delayed, the more grievous the consequences would be. Everything that he had worked to achieve, that the Kuat bloodline had built this corporation into, might yet be wiped away by the forces that conspired against him. He knew all these things. They weighed upon his spirit with the grinding mass of planets. Yet, he still found this thought returning as though pulled by some even greater gravitational force to the bounty hunter Boba Fett and all that had happened in the past. Fett was the key to it all. 
The key to what had happened then, and what must happen now, if Kuat Drive Yards was to be saved. There were things that all the galaxy knew about that past. The story that had grown to almost legendary proportions. About the breakup of the old Bounty Hunters Guild, and the things that had come about after that. The capture of the renegade Imperial Stormtrooper Trahin Vossond, and what had happened when Boba Fett had gone to collect the bounty for him. Those matters were public knowledge, or at least some of them were, and other ones were secrets locked inside the skull of Kuat of Kuat. He had to make sure they remained secret. If doing so demanded the death of other creatures, specifically Boba Fett, then that was a regrettable necessity. Business was business. He would agree with me about that thought Kuat, as his gaze lifted to the cold stars above the docks. Boba Fett would hardly be able to blame him for taking care of business in as efficient and deadly a manner as was needed. Kuat turned away from the high, segmented view screens. It irked him that there was so much that had to be dealt with as soon as possible. And yet he still had to bother with distractions, such as a summons to a convocation of the planet Kuat's ruling households. With a burden-laden sigh, he lifted the heavy robes from the carved stand upon which they hung between such events. So simple a matter, and he was transformed. All it took was for Kuat of Kuat to don the formal robes, the garb that signified his position at the head of the noble families of this world. He so rarely left the headquarters of the Kuat drive yards and his austere suite of offices looking out over the construction docks, that his simple coveralls had become his unconscious preference. The same as that which the corporation's engineering and security staff wore, with no signs of rank attached to them. If those beneath him obeyed his orders, it was because they knew he had earned the authority through more than just genetic inheritance. Even the Felix, the silky-haired creature that he cradled in his arms, had trouble recognising him in the robes, with their sweep of intricate golden-threaded embroidery falling from his shoulders. Kuat of Kuat the master of one of the most powerful corporations in the galaxy, had had to kneel beside his lab bench and coax the animal out with soothing, enticing words. Poor thing, thought Kuat, as he stroked the special place behind its ears. A purr of induced bliss sounded from deep in its throat. As with all the members of its decorative, pampered species, the Felix believed itself to be the master of this domain. It took interruptions to its expected schedule with an ill grace. As do I. Kuat of Kuat had carried the animal to the office suite's arching, segmented view screens. He gazed out at the ships being built or readied for launch, massive commissions for the Imperial Navy of Palpatine. Enough weaponry studded the hulls to intimidate all but the most foolhardy of foes. The laser cannons being mounted into the open skeletal frames required bracing and recoil dissipation casings that would have withstood explosions measured in the gigatonnage range. Anything less and a single shot fired in battle would rip a destroyer or battlecruiser in two, a victim of its own lethal strength. The contemplation of such an effort brought a wry grimace of self-recognition to Kuat's face. We must always be careful, he whispered into the Felix's feathery ear, not to blow ourselves up with our own weapons. The Felix stirred drowsily in Kuat's arms. As far as it was concerned, all of its plans had succeeded admirably. It was fed, warm, and content. Kuat wished that he could feel the same about all his schemes and machinations. Even now, Forces that he had set into motion were circling about him and the Kuat drive yards, like the iron teeth of some invisible trap, greater than the worlds and corporations it seized upon. He heard the tall doors of the office suite open without disturbing the feelings. Kuat glanced over his shoulder. Yes? 
The head of security for Kuat Drive Yards stood in the angle of light from the corridor outside. Your personal transport is ready. As with all of the corporation staff, Fanald spoke without elaborate formalities. To take you to the gathering of families. I don't need to be reminded, said Kuat, about where I'm going. The assembly of the planet Kuat's ruling households was the reason for his having donned the formal robes, and for his bad temper. I'm sorry. The security head was one of his most valued staff, and had done nothing wrong to merit such sharp language. But this is all coming at a very inconvenient time. That was an understatement. Even if all Kuat of Kuat had to worry about was the stepped-up pace of construction at Kuat Drive Yards, the constant pressure from Emperor Palpatine to supply the Imperial Navy with the ships needed to crush the burgeoning rebellion, he would have had more than enough on his mind. But with those other concerns, some of which were secrets that he alone bore the weight of on his shoulders, it was a crushing burden. Or to be more exact, it would have been a crushing burden for almost any other sentient creature. Kuat of Kuat closed his eyes, his fingertips automatically stroking the phalanx's fur. If he was not as other creatures were, it was because he had been born this way. The hereditary chief executive of Kuat Drive Yards. The blood flowed in his veins of the other engineers and leaders who had preceded him. All that he had done the schemes that he had devised, had been for the sake of the corporation. There were so many in this galaxy who sought the destruction of Kuat Drive Yards, who wished to disassemble it into bits or swallow it whole. The corporation's own best customer, Emperor Palpatine himself, and Palpatine's chief henchman, Lord Vader, were among the number. Kuat Drive Yards had had at least a few friends among the leaders of the Old Republic. Those had been swept away in the course of Palpatine's rise to absolute power. Now everything, the very survival of the corporation, depended upon the wits and courage of those who shepherded it. And now, with all that was going on, to have the ruling households getting on his case? No apology necessary! The security head showed a wry smile. When, if ever, would there have been a convenient time to deal with them? You're on point there, admitted Kuat. The phalanx protested as he peeled it away from his chest and deposited it in a fleece-lined basket near the workbench. With its tail huffily erect, the animal jumped from its bed and went stalking for its food dish. Kuat brushed away the silken hairs it had left on the front of his robes. All right, he said wearily. Let's get this over with. Fernald closed the office suite's door behind them, then followed Kuat toward the docking area. I've gotten as much advanced information on the meeting as I could. Among his other duties, Fernald was in charge of surveillance, or, in blunter terms, spying upon the planet's ruling households. From all indications, it appears that the Kinlian Elder will be there in person. That old fool? Kuat shook his head as he walked. The Elder had always been his chief opponent in the household's deliberative council. Of all the families, the Kinlians had fought the hardest, and over centuries and generations, against the inheritance exemption by which the Kuat line maintained its hold over Kuat drive yards. I'm supposed they managed to pry him out of his life support systems. The younger members of the family are using the Elder as a front, so they had a new portable life support system designed and built just so the Elder could come to an emergency meeting like this. The security head raised an eyebrow. A very expensive system, too. It apparently has several redundant layers of first-degree droid intelligence built within, with constant real-time monitoring of all bodily functions. And, get this, it even has cryo-storage of all important organs, with 
total immune reaction suppression at a cellular level, ready to go at any sign of cardiopulmonary or renal hepatic failure. The elder could be getting a heart transplant as you were talking to him, and you wouldn't even know it, except for the little blinking lights on the front of the unit. Charming, said Kuat. Of course, that presupposes that he started out with one inside him. He could see the docking area attendants up ahead, standing by the open hatchway of his personal transport. Who else is going to be there? The usual cabal. All of the Kanelans, their Talbans and their affiliates. The Kul Vult clan and their Morganic allegiances. Probably a good deal of the Kinesi. Kuat stopped in the middle of the corridor and looked at his security head. That's more than the usual. Security head nodded in agreement. This is the big one, technician. The Kanelans have been trying to overturn the inheritance exemption since before your grandfather ran this corporation. They've called in all the favors that any of the other ruling households might owe them, because they think that they can do it now. Maybe they can. Kuat paused beside the transport's hatchway as the attendants drew back. Maybe I should let them. Then dealing with the Empire and all the rest would be someone else's problem. He pulled the formal robes tighter around himself to facilitate getting into the tight passenger space of the transport. He looked over at Fenald. What do you think? That would be your decision to make. Standing with hands clasped behind his back, the other man gave a single nod. But it would be the end of Kuat Drive Yards as an independent corporation. No one else in the ruling families has the ability or the courage to stand up to Palpatine. I sometimes think, said Kuat, that courage is simply another name for foolhardiness. Gathering up the broad and inconvenient hem of the robes, he stepped into the transport. I'm old and tired, or at least that's the way I feel, so it might as well be true. He had to duck his head down to look back at the figure standing outside the hatchway. Perhaps instead of going and dealing with these tiresome creatures, I could pilot this ship straight to Coruscant. I could make a deal with Palpatine. If I give in now and just let him take over Kuad Drive Yards, I'd save him a lot of trouble. Perhaps in gratitude, he'd pension me off with enough credits to eke out a comfortable existence on some obscure planet. It's more likely, technician, that once Emperor Palpatine has what he wants from you, that he would simply have you eliminated. Kuat managed a grim half-smile. I believe you're right. He settled into the transport's two-person passenger area. So I don't have any choice then, do I? About going and dealing with the Kanelans and all the rest of the ruling households. No, replied Fenald. You don't. Then, said Kuat, my duties and actions are one and the same. He turned toward the transport again. Fanard laid a restraining hand on Kuat's forearm. Now, ever technician, you are not obliged to face this particular duty by yourself. Kuat looked back at the head of security. What do you mean? It's madness for you to go there alone. The Kanelans and the others are obviously planning some unpleasant surprise for you. You'll need all the help you can get. Perhaps so, but that doesn't mean I can have it. I hope you'll forgive any rashness on my part, technician, but I took the initiative of contacting the Master of Etiquette for the ruling households. Fanal gave a slight nod as he withdrew his hand from the sleeve of Kuat's formal robes. And... He gave a different ruling on that point of protocol. Since the Kanelans are bringing their Talbans to this gathering, the normal restrictions do not apply. Under the ancestral household cold, the Talbans are technically outsiders, not quite true family members. So, to maintain strict reciprocity, the household of Kuat is thereby permitted to bring in an outsider as well. I see. Kuat mulled over the information. And your suggestion is that you should accompany me? More than a suggestion. It is, technician, my most urgent advice. 
Kuat peered closer at the security head. Why are you so concerned about coming to this gathering? The ruling households of Kuat are hardly an entertaining crowd. As I said before, they're up to something. And what is your evidence, your hard evidence for that suspicion? Fernald was silent for a moment, before answering. No evidence, he said quietly, other than what I feel in my gut. The security head's reply disturbed Kuat. Fernald had never before been one to act upon anything except facts, as cold and hard as the jurisdeal employed in the Kuat drive yard's construction docks. But still. All right, said Kuat. He pointed toward the hatchway of the personal transport. We'd better be on our way. They'll be waiting for us. And that is where I am going to leave it today, folks. Chapter 13 is very long, so we will continue that next week in our next video. Uh, for now, I'll just say hi to some folks in the comments, and then we can all go home. Well, you're probably already home. And so am I, actually. I do this from home. I don't know what I'm talking about. Fergal Lurga commented, saying, Just subscribed. Thank you for joining the Fulcrum Knights. Been listening for a while, and I really enjoy your work. Your voices are damn good and really entertains me while I'm at work. Workforce represent. Keep it up. On the off chance, isn't it rumoured that Bosk and Boba have a duet coming up? Um, but perhaps maybe there's some sort of Moss Esper open mic night or something that they might be going and karaokeing at. But what's a good duet for Bosk and Boba to do? Any ideas? Drop them in the comments. The Doviverse also says, I caught up, but it's bittersweet. No more binging. I know exactly how you feel, Doviverse. I've had that feeling with so many channels on YouTube. And Goog Souders said, When I was a kid, there was a bounty hunter named Bylery Valance in Star Wars comics. I really enjoyed his story. He was not the perfect hunter or always ready like this boba. If you get time, check him out. He is also an ex-stormtrooper. Thanks very much, Goog. Thank you very much for the recommendation. I've never heard of that character. I'll have to have a look at it. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. If you've gotten this far, please definitely leave a like on the video. It always helps us. And if you have not yet, please subscribe and join the Order of the Knights of Fulcrum. For now, this is it from me. So, my friends, please remember that we are all Fulcrum. <laughs>